Hi guys, my name's Ben Guilford. I am the owner of the Firebrick Company and I am often a pretty excited individual. Uh, it's not rare for me to be excited, but today I'm particularly excited because we're doing something that I have actually been waiting for for like nine years. Uh, if you've watched any of our videos uh, before, you've probably seen us building, where we're, we're showing you how to put one of our wood-fired ovens together or maybe how to fire it up. But something we haven't done is how to cook in them. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. We are doing the very first uh, video of our series of how to go about cooking in our wood-fired ovens, which is very exciting. I'm not gonna limit us to doing the videos in a particular way, uh, but one of the things that I really wanna be doing is I wanna show you how you can use the full heat cycle of your oven. We could just do some videos on like, all right, this is how to cook a pizza. Um, there's lots of great content out there. I can highly recommend Vito Iacopelli if you wanna learn more about like really specific doughs and things like that. He's a fantastic YouTuber. Uh, he's got some amazing content, check his videos out. What I wanna do is I wanna show you how you can cook a whole bunch of things in your oven using the heat cycle as you heat the oven up. So we could cook on the way up cooking at high temperatures, and then how you can cook on the way down, uh, cooking some different uh, uh, foods as the oven cools. Uh, so I could show you a fair bit. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a reasonable cook. Uh, I'm not terrible, but I am an engineer. And let's be honest, I'm a better engineer than I am chef, than I am, than I am a cook. So the plan is, rather than me bestowing all of my bountiful knowledge about cooking uh, upon you, what I would rather do is get some guests in to come and join me, and they're going to show us how it is that they cook in their oven. They're going to uh, take us through some of their favorite recipes uh, so that, well, we can all learn together. Uh, now the plan is uh, we, we've got this wonderful studio here uh, at our showroom in Melbourne. So we're gonna be doing some filming in here. But in the future, we'll also be visiting customers. Uh, so coming to your home with you know your blessing, of course, I'm not just gonna rock up, um, but we'll come and we'll film with customers to see what it is that you cook in your part of the world, how you use your oven, and, and learn from you because look, I know quite a lot uh, about how the ovens work, but I am astounded at how often customers will share things with me about different ways they're using their oven, how they're getting the most out of their oven. And uh, if I can share that with you through these videos, then awesome. And hey, it's a bit of a perk. I get to travel and uh, you know get out there and, and meet our, our wonderful customers in person. So. We hope you enjoy these videos. Uh, we will be adding to them regularly over the years. Uh, so this is our very, very first one, which is really exciting. Uh, and so for our first video, I have asked our general manager, Marcus, who is also a Guilford, uh, to join us. And he is gonna be showing us some of his favorite recipes. Hi guys, my name is Ben Guilford, and welcome to the first of our Flamesmith Feasts. Hey guys, my name is Marcus Guilford. I'm the general manager here at the Firebrick Company. Uh, I pretty much make sure that the day-to-day -day runnings of the business actually happen now that Ben doesn't really have much of an input. He makes sure the customers are happy. Um, I, yeah, I also ensure that the kind of the quality stays at that really high level that we're after um, and make sure that you get your oven on time and it's in good order. Uh, ever since I can remember, I've been cooking with my mom in the kitchen. I actually took over cooking in general at home. Um, and then my mum and dad bought one of these wood-fired ovens and I helped my dad build it. We actually still hold the record for the fastest brick oven build time. And as soon as I cooked in that the first time, I just fell in love. Cook cooking over fire was, was absolutely my passion. Um, I, I couldn't, couldn't think of cooking in any other way after that. Um, so I, I moved down to Melbourne. I hounded Ben for a job until he gave me one. And I, and I worked my way up until I was a general manager. Right. Uh, so, firstly, 
I'll have you know, I still do stuff here, all right? Just a little bit. This, uh, I, I do a lot of important <laughs> things, frankly. Uh, yes, but actually, Marcus manages all of our production. He makes sure that everything gets built. So he's got a, quite a big team down, uh, down there now. Uh, we have five factories in this complex at the time of filming, and it's his job to stay on top of everybody. Uh, so not only is he a very beautiful man, but he's, uh, he's pretty switched on. Um, now, well, I should actually say, so we, he's a Guildford. I'm a Guildford. He is my cousin. Uh, so, um, you know, somehow he has inherited, like, no, 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 no. Just so many of the good no, genes. Like, I, I don't know, I'm, I missed out on these, but... <laughs> you got the brains. Oh, I missed out on all the brains. <laughs> all right, well, um, so take us through today. We're going to be, we're, we've broken it up into cooking on the way up, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, cooking at some high temperatures, yep. and then we're going to cook on the way down. What are we going to be cooking on the way up? So the first thing that we're actually going to be doing is preparing our dough. Um, they're going to be for our pizzas when we're at those really high temperatures. Um, but we're also going to be splitting that dough apart and making a flatbread with it. Now that's going to be cooked on the way up, as you said. Okay. Um, and we're going to use that to accompany our dip that we're going to make and our cheese. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, everything we're going to be doing today is going to be in the ovens, even our passata that we're doing for our okay. pizzas as well. We're going to do that in the ovens as well. And then there's a, a cheese. A cheese as well. Yeah, we're going to do a triple brie um, cheese in the oven. Uh, that's going to be... I want to say impregnated, but that's not the right word. <laughs> uh, we're going to be putting in some garlic and rosemary in it to, yep. to add some flavors to it as yeah, well. Nice, nice. Yeah. Okay. We're not actually making no, brie, no, no, no. but we're, we're going to be cooking some brie. Exactly. Yeah, Showing okay. you how to cook it, get it really nice and soft, but kind of charred on the outside a little bit as well. Okay. Uh, it's actually one of my favorite things to do in the oven. I'll be honest, I've had this um, at our, we do a last Friday of the month sort of celebration. We, we finish a little bit early as a team and Mark has made this a couple of times and it is easy. It looks mm. easy and it is delicious. Yeah. We have our showroom here, uh, our, it's, you know, doubles as our, our studio, which is pretty cool. Uh, so we're gonna be firing up the P85. So we're gonna be firing this one up. This is cold, uh, haven't fired it for some time, uh, and doing our cooking on the way up and our high temperature cooking in this oven. And then the D105 on my left, we're gonna be doing the slow cooking in. Uh, so we fired that yesterday. I left it at about 300 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's now down to about 230, 240 degrees. So we're gonna be doing some cooking in there. Okay, so you told us about cooking on the way up, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, what similar. are we doing at the high temperature? So 350, 400 degrees? Yep. What yep. are we doing up there? So the first thing we're going to be doing is making our passata for our pizzas, um, and then after that we're going to be doing some vegetables for our mains. Now our main is going to be probably my favorite cut of meat that there is, and that is a ribeye steak. Mm -hmm. uh, now this is a 400 gram, four week aged ribeye. Um, it's, it, I've made it a few times in the last few weeks, I'm not gonna lie about this, because it is that good. <laughs> he's, been he's, been, he's been practicing. Yeah, been, a little bit of practice more because of the deliciousness factor. Okay. Yes, it's for sure, for sure. Um, and we're gonna be doing that, you know, on the grill, then into the pan with some butter and rosemary, then back onto the grill. A little bit of a, I've experimented with this cooking method a little bit, and I find this, this comes out perfect every time. Beautiful, yeah. okay, all right. And then the last thing will be some cooking as the oven cools down. Because yep. I think w one of the things that some people may not understand is, we well, don't just have to cook in the oven you know, that night when it's really mm, hot and the mm. fire's roaring, you can actually use some heat as the oven cools down. There's lots of other things that you can cook. In fact, you actually tend to, you cook a lot of things at lower temperatures, like 400 degrees is not great temperature to bake at. Yes, I was about to say, it's actually probably harder to cook at those really high yeah. temperatures because everything is burning instantly yes. than it is to cook on the way down when you chuck something in there and just leave it. Yep. You know, come check it every hour or so. Yeah, and you're cooking at those more conventional temperatures yep. around that 200 degree Celsius mark. Yep. Um, so what are we doing? Uh, for that, we're actually going to be doing a pot roast chicken. So we're going to be cutting up some vegetables, putting them in one of our, our cast iron pans, just putting essentially a whole chicken on top, a bit of stock, a bit of um, seasoning, and then a lid on that into the oven to, to bake for a couple of hours. Then we'll take the lid off, let it brown up, and, and then eat it after that. <laughs> As I said before, we're going to be firing up the P85. 
Uh, so I'm gonna be using our fire and forget technique to fire that up because I do want to get it good and hot. Uh, now, if you want to see more about how to do that technique, check out uh, the video uh, linked in the description. We take you through the fire and forget method. The thing that I like about the fire and forget method is you don't have to stand in front of the oven the whole time while it heats up. Oh, it's amazing. Well, you've got other things to do. Yeah, like you've absolutely. Got prep to you've do. got prep to do. Uh, and so if you're constantly having to tend to the oven, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's like, well, I mean, it's great if you if you want to get out of the house. If um, you want a beer next to the oven. If you want to have a beer next to the oven, it's, <laughs> it's a valid excuse. Yeah. It's like, oh no, got to go and stand in front of the oven for two hours. Uh, but uh, if you do want to do some organizing while the oven's yeah, firing up, yeah. this is a great method to use because you literally just light it and let it go. One little change I've made to the fire and forget method since we did it last was uh, you can build a raft of timber to, uh, to sort of build the fire on so you can push it into the oven. Or if you've got a bit of cardboard around, you can build it on a piece of cardboard and use that as your raft. That works really well too. And it acts as a little bit of uh, kindling, of you know, just like your paper to get the fire up and going. So if you haven't watched the fire and forget method, it is but very simple. We put some big heavy timber at the back of the oven. That's our sort of main fuel. Uh, and then we build a fort fire that we push right up against that heavy timber. Uh, and that's what we're gonna light first. Now that will burn down and it will heat up the floor. It sort of spreads itself out and heats up the floor. One of the most important uh, sort of steps in this process is to make sure that you put some timber, some decent sized pieces leaning against the front and the sides of the fort. The reason for that is so that it doesn't fall forward, right? So the front face of that fort is gonna burn faster because that's where the, all the air is. The air's hitting the front of it. So that burns down first and it becomes unstable. And if you don't have some timber supporting it, it will collapse forward and you'll come back to your oven, you know, half an hour after you lit it and it might have sort of just spread itself out on the floor and kind of gone out, which is not what we want. What we want is for it to burn down and fall backwards into the big heavy timber at the back. <laughs> All right, uh, so we fired the oven, or as in we lit the oven. It's been burning now for about, what did you say, 10 minutes? About 10 minutes. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that method, man, it takes off pretty fast. Yeah, so, I mean, have a look uh, at it. It is going. Yeah. Now, well, we, we'll be able to get uh, cooking in that fairly quickly, but hey, while the oven's heating up, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we can get prepping. So what are we doing now? Yep, so the first thing we're gonna do is get our dough ready. Um, as I said before, this is gonna be for our pizza and for our flatbread. Um, so the first thing you wanna do is just make sure you've got your scale all ready um, and you've got a nice big mixing bowl to do this in. Preferably have a mixer as well. This can be done without a mixer. Um, it, is a, it is much harder and takes, it takes a lot of arm strength bit because of, it's a fair bit, of, fair bit of kneading involved. Okay, um, but it can be done. You don't, but you it don't, can be done. You don't have to have this Exactly, and, we'll, and I'll quickly go through the kind of a, a little kneading technique as okay, well, cool. which will make it a bit easier for you. Now we want about 600 grams of flour, um, so we'll just slowly add that in. While he's doing that, I will say, don't worry, you don't have to be like madly scribbling this down. We'll be putting the recipes up on the website for you. They'll be linked in the description, so don't, don't feel like you, you need to take lots of notes along the way. And there's, there's actually no need to sieve the flour or anything. And with this dough, it's very nice because you don't have to be precise. Um, a lot of baking is, is almost like a science. Yeah, We've got to be really, no, really baking careful. Baking is science. That's is why a science? I, I like baking. As an engineer, baking works for me. Exactly. Because it's so specific. I was just eyeing, I'm like, that's 649 grams, Marcus. Yeah. You said 600. And, ex and that's the beauty of this dough is that it's like a beginner's dough. Okay. There's, there's room for error okay. and it's not going to kind of affect affect the end result. Next thing we want to do is add our, um, add our yeast. Now we want to be really careful not to let our yeast and our salt touch and the way we do that is we just using our hands is fine just make a little crevice in one side of the of the flour. All right now that we've got that we just need to add our yeast. Um, now again not needing to be too precise just two standard teaspoons and we need we need to really make sure that our yeast never comes into contact with our salt um, up until we mix them all together and incorporate all our ingredients. So just two kind of even 
you can see there about an even teaspoon, two of those. The next thing we want to do is on the other side of our flour is make another crevice for our salt. We just want one teaspoon of salt. And again, it doesn't have to be too precise, just a decent teaspoon. Uh, Marcus and I actually do share something in common, and that is we both have a genetic uh, tremor. Mm. It's not Parkinson's. It's not Parkinson's. It's Although not it's been called, called that before oh, yeah. to me. Yeah, yes. yeah, people like to say, oh, you got Parkinson's. <laughs> no, we, it's called familial tremors. Mm. Uh, and it's just a, a slight tremor in the hands. So it's we're great. not actually nervous. It's character building. It is, it is. It's, it's doing life on hard mode. That's what I like to call it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Keeps, us, keeps us humble. <laughs> uh, all right, moving on. All right, so we've got our yeast in, we've got our flour, and we've got our salt. The next thing we need is our fat. Um, today we're gonna to be using a, just an olive oil. It's probably my favorite fat to use in bread or in dough. Um, and again, we just want to make another crevice, but this time in the center. So if you've ever made like cakes, would have done this to add your wet ingredients. So you just make that kind of hole in the center. Now you wanna add your, your olive oil. And I find the more olive oil I add, the softer the dough becomes. Right. So. For this recipe, it's about a quarter of a cup, but I usually go a quarter of a cup and then just a, a little slosh extra. A little, a little, a little slosh. A little bit extra. Exactly, so we'll just quickly add this. All right, so we've got, that's our quarter of a cup, and now we'll just add in just a little slosh. A little cheek, yeah. Just to get that really nice and soft. All right, so we'll just incorporate our ingredients. Literally, get your hand, stick it in here, and just mix it all together. So that's part, it's part of the that's fun at the, the same apron. time. You want to try and get all, like, you're going to get some fat stuck to your hands. You just want to get that off or some oil, sorry. So here you're talking about using fat. So could butter be used? Yes, Is yes. So, so with breads, you're essentially, the, there's four ingredients you have to have in bread. Yep. It's, a, it's a flour, salt, yeast, and a fat. Okay. Um, and that fat can be, can be anything, can be oil, any yep. kind of oil, butter, um, it all really depends on what you're, you know, what the result you're trying to get. The type of bread you're Exactly, okay. exactly. Awesome. You can still see there's lots of lumps of the, the, the fat and that's, flour. That's not a problem that's, for us. No, that's absolutely normal. Okay. This is perfectly normal. So cool. we'll get this into our mixer next. So we'll just slide it in, drop it down. And you just want a, a fairly, uh, fairly low mix rate on this. Yep. We'll only need to do this for maybe 30 seconds mm -hmm. and then we'll slowly start to add our water. Now you want to try and get most of your water in the early stages of the, the mixing. The so, so if you would add water later on? It's just a bit harder. If you've ever made dough before and you try to add water later, it, you'll see that it kind of just slaps around the bowl. Yeah. It does incorporate eventually, but just not as well as if you just get it done at the right. very start. Okay. Okay. Um, so I've, got, I've left a little bit of water here. I can see that it's still a bit dry, so I'm just going to keep, I'll add probably all of this. Yep. And we'll just crank that up probably to about a, a four out of 10 to really get all those ingredients incorporated. And we'll see what it looks like in about 30 seconds time to see if we need to add more water in or add a bit more flour if need be. Fantastic. Yeah. So what you have a look now, Ben, if you, if you have a look in here, okay. we'll pull our dough out. It's all yep. been incorporated in. That's only been about 30 seconds wow. of mixing, maybe even less. And we can pull that out of here. It's clean. I said, what sent you? Essentially what you're looking for is for the dough to have cleaned the bowl for you. Yeah. If you have a look in there, mm. there isn't much. Yeah. Now this Check. isn't the end of our mixing. We've still okay. got to put it back in. All right. But what I wanted to show you is just whether we need to add more water or take more water out. And so you can see that the dough is really nice and soft. Yep. It's not sticking to my hand. Yes. This means that we've pretty much got the perfect amount of water in. If it was too wet, what would I be seeing? If it was too wet, it would almost be a slop. It would be very, very sticky. You would, yep. you would really wouldn't be able to take it out of the bowl like this, and yes. it would be leaving lots of dough still on the bowl. All right, and then the opposite, if it was too dry. If it was too dry, it would be very, very hard. Okay. Um, you wouldn't be able to just you know pull it like this. It would be a very hard ball. Okay, so what you're um, saying is you've, you've nailed it. Nailed it, exactly. If you stick to those, those weights though, you pretty much nail it every time. Okay, Yeah. awesome. All right, so our water's all done. Our water content is perfect. So we put that back in the mixer and we need to let this mix on just a, a say a, a low to medium um, speed. And we need to let that mix for about 10 minutes okay. or until we achieve um, the right gluten development. And I'll show you a couple of tricks on how to, how to tell when that is. Yep. Um, 
And also one trick that will get your dough perfect every single time. Okay. Well, I should actually mention, like he's talking about gluten and he, he really does sound like he knows what he's talking about. He uh, has, has actually studied Baking, yes? Don't, yes, yeah, studied, yes, but I don't call myself a baker or a right. chef by any means. Okay. I call myself passionate about cooking. Yeah. yeah, he, yeah. It was very specific at the start of today. He's like, please don't call me a chef. <laughs> don't call me a baker. People will look very closely at what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All the, just the... Yeah. yeah. Now, this is just like a, a, an amalgamation of like the experiences I've had, yep. mistakes I've made, yep. and books that I've read. I like it. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Okay, so you mentioned before uh, we're going to let this run for 10 minutes. Yep, if you yep. didn't have this oh, yes. ridiculous red beast, kneading. what would you do? Yeah, so kneading is a bit of fun. Um, when you're kneading the dough and you're making the dough for the first time, you want to use as least amount of flour as possible. That's so you can see here I've just got like a tiny little pinch, yep. and that's just to stop it from sticking to any crevices in the, in the board here. Yep, yep. Um, so, so when you're when you're kneading, you want to be really, really aggressive. And the best way I find to do is to keep your arms really straight and to be using the palms of your your hands and your body weight. And the reason for that is so if you're if you're using your 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 arms and your wrists, it gets very tiring very quickly. Yep. But if you're using like your weight, then uh, it's then you can really so you're just rocking on your um, heels. exactly exactly. Yeah, okay. So I'm just rocking, and all I'm doing is getting the dough, pulling it forwards, and then kind of folding it down on itself yep. like that yep. and as I pick it up I put it down fold it and do it again yep. and you can get this into a nice motion oh look at that that does look really good and it's actually really cathartic yep. kneading is it takes a long time but if you once you just get into the habit and the routine of it um, it's very very nice and relaxing would you need it to <laughs> need it uh, for 10 minutes as per like we were going to mix it in this thing for 10 you would minutes. probably need to knead it for longer longer yes because it's more aggressive this is more aggressive than okay exactly yeah wow. I can quickly already show you that um, that gluten development technique yeah, yeah, please. is all you do is you rip off a little bit yep get some flour in your hand so, so it doesn't this, stick so this is uh, this is not developing the gluten is this like this testing? is testing to see okay. what stage we're at okay so you've got a little bit of flour in your hand so the dough doesn't stick to you very much now what you want to do is you just want to slowly start pulling out from the edges and trying to create, this is called the window pane method, um, and you're trying to create as thin a layer of the dough as possible. So all I'm doing is slowly so stretching it out. It out. Okay. And when the gluten is fully developed, you should be able to kind of, it should be a window pane. Can you see that, how I can nearly so see through it? So you can actually it? see through it. Yeah, 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 okay. So we're near, We're actually nearly there. This is actually developed quite fast. But it's tearing. But so see, when it's tearing. It's tear right, okay. That's where we're I mean, I done. can see through it now. Exactly. But that's not what we're after. We're after a window pane. So okay. a really, really thin, transparent so piece needs, of dough. This needs more kneading. And when we do that, it develops the gluten. Yeah. The gluten gets stronger or just more strands? More strands. Right. Look, I, I, I don't know the science behind it. Again. Apparently not a, not a baker. baker. Okay. Um, but yeah, so we'll get that back into the mixer for yep. a little bit. All right, so that's been about seven minutes now, bit, okay. maybe a little bit longer. We'll yep. turn that off and we'll do the window pane method again, just to okay. double check. And so, so roll it into a ball first, like this. Yep. And then, do, yeah, just slowly pulling it out. You don't want to be too aggressive with it because you will tear it, even if it is perfect gluten development. Right, okay. But see this, this is where we are perfectly there. Oh, okay. And you can see see those little strands of, that's the gluten yeah, development. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that is what we're after. We'll get a little bit of flour on our prepping board, on our proving board. Yep. And this is where we just want to shape it a little bit so that it's growing out into a nice, a nice ball. Okay. It's not just growing in a weird mess. Yep. So all I'll do is slap it down. I'll fold it over. That's just to allow a little bit more air in there mm -hmm. and then just pull it back. So you're just trying to get a really nice smooth dough. And if you have a look at that, that is a beautiful oh, okay. dough there. It's gorgeous. It's really nice and smooth on the top. Yep. And then if you want, you can just give it a little roll, trying to pinch that, that oh, seam that together. Dough. Okay, cool. And there we go. There we have our dough that we're gonna use for our flatbread yep. and for our pizzas. So we'll rest it for probably just Maybe like 10 minutes. Yeah, should be good. Awesome. Now we're gonna start prepping for our eggplant dip. What we're after is for the, the eggplant to pretty much be falling apart. Okay. Where we can just cut it in half and essentially scrape out 
the mush from the inside. The goodness. The goodness, yeah. Awesome. Um, How are we going to do this? So first of all, the first thing we're going to do is stab the eggplant with lots of holes. Okay. Now I've just found that this gives a bit more of a smoky flavor. It allows the smoke to easily penetrate okay. into the flesh. Yep. Now you don't want to go too deep, maybe just like a couple of centimeters deep and just really go to town on it. We'll discard the skin completely. We're just after that, the inside flesh. Okay. Um, See, I saw, I saw them do this on MasterChef. When we, we, we supplied the grills, yep. mas a challenge for MasterChef earlier this year, and one of the contestants actually just filled the whole grill pit with eggplants, just threw them in on the charcoal. Okay. Yep. And, and that's because, well, you're not using the skin. Exactly. Okay. And I've, and I've done that before as well, where I've, I haven't pierced the skin. Yep. And I just feel like I've gotten more flavor from doing this in the past. Alrighty, so our eggplants are all skewered, ready to go in the oven. We'll just put those aside for now. The next thing we wanna do is get our garlic all ready. So we just got a few cloves of garlic here. The reason we're putting the garlic onto a skewer is just so that it's nice and easy to, to move around in the oven. Um, so you don't lose them. Exactly, yeah, they're, they're small, easy to lose. Perfect, all done. So that's our garlic ready to go and our eggplant ready to go. Um, we're gonna be putting these onto our Tuscan grill just so that they're kind of taken off the floor of the oven and don't just char on one side completely right. from the heat of the floor. Yep. Um, we wanna keep that air circulating around them. Okay, so, so we're, it's just... not, we're not like cooking them like in a pan. No, it's no. the air circulating. Exactly, exactly. So. We've got some nice embers here. We're literally just pushing our grill so that it's completely in the oven. Okay, um, I should point out right now that the the oven we haven't poked it or prodded it the the coals uh, it's just burned down from the fire that we lit earlier uh, and so looking in there we've got some nice coals developing in the back uh, we're, we're starting to clear the dome so we're getting some good heat into it one thing i was just going to mention as well is it's much easier to put on food onto the grill when it's in the mouth of the oven right so to do that all i'll do is uh, grab my trusty pan hook this is a great tool for moving, you know, moving pans around the oven, moving grills around the oven. I use this all the time. So I literally just bring it back to the very front of the oven and then we'll get our eggplant and our garlic and they just get chucked on there. Now I try to put the thicker side of the eggplant to the, the back of the oven just because of the, the heat distribution. Exactly, okay. exactly. And the garlic, obviously much smaller than the eggplant, I'll put a bit closer to the front. Looking at an eggplant here, I've, I've actually rotated these around. Um, you can feel on this side here, they're really nice and soft. If you want to have a feel there, Benny. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. very hot at the, at the front of the oven there. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're sort of crispy on the outside, but like, it almost feels hollow. Exactly, it almost feels hollow. And that's just, it is really reducing in there. And becomes... Fantastic, right, so look at that. They're, they're looking really good at the moment. So what I might do is I won't push it all the way back into the oven because the oven is incredibly hot right now. What I'll do is I'll just leave them in the mouth of the oven here because it's still very hot. Yeah. They're still gonna cook, yep. um, but we're just not ready for them just yet. And okay. the, I reckon just from the feel of it, I can still feel a bit of firmness. So at, the, at the back, yeah, okay. So that's yep. not, this, is, this feels really almost like a dry skin exactly this it. is what we're after for the hey. over the entire thing it's hot all right so we've separated we've taken a bit of our dough off our main dough and this is going to be used for our flatbread so we'll just put it on the board here for the time being and we'll get our dough into its resting place until we turn it into a pizza dough so to do that we've just got a, a bit of a bigger silver bowl here get a bit of um, olive oil spray canola spray absolutely fine just give it a very light spray yep just to stop it from sticking? Just to stop it from sticking. Okay. And before we put it in, we'll just quickly give it a fold. And this is just getting some more air into it. So just okay. slap it down, yep. fold it over, and, then and chuck it back in there. Beautiful. Okay. Now we'll put that aside. A bit of glad wrap And a bit that. of glad wrap on it. Yeah. And that'll allow it to proof. Now with the rest of the dough that we've taken off, just put it on the, on the bench, flatten it out a little bit, and we're going to be incorporating some other ingredients just to give the flatbread a little bit more flavor. 
We're going to be using a little bit of fresh rosemary, a little bit of a spice mix I've made up here, and just some salt. What's in the uh, spice mix? Tell in me. the spice mix, we've just got some oregano, some dried basil, some actually a little bit of dried rosemary as okay. well, um, some garlic salt, and lots of pepper. All right, so we're just going to add just a little bit more salt, a pinch of salt, just on top of the bread. Yep. And a bit of our spice mix. Now you can add as much or as little of this as you'd like. Yep. Do whatever spices you like, essentially. Okay. Um, so we've just got a bit of those on there. Maybe a little bit more spice. And then some fresh rosemary. So I'll just get a strand of rosemary. Just pulling back against it. We'll take off the little, little leaves. leaves. I don't know what you call them. Are they leaves? They're leaves. I think they're leaves. But we really want to try and break that rosemary up so we don't just have a big old chunk of it. Right, okay. And so now that we've got that, we'll just fold it over on itself. Oh. Fold it over again, yep. and exactly how we were kneading before, we just want to do that again. So, pushing on the dough, pulling it back. You're stretching it, you're tearing it. Exactly, yep, yep. yep. We're trying to move all those ingredients around. Yeah, okay. And as you're doing this, if you notice that you haven't put in, maybe, maybe you thought you'd put in a lot of spice, but then yep. as you're mixing around, you're like, oh, like this that. is pretty sparse. Like this, this actually isn't as much as I expected. Just put a little bit more in. And just keep mixing it around. But a lot of what you said, like this dough particularly, it's a forgiving dough. Exactly. You yep. can get a, you know, the ratios a tiny bit off. Mm -hmm. It'll still work. It, it's honestly, it has never failed me. Okay. I've never made this dough and be like, oh no, I have to go get buy some pita breads. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So this doesn't need much kneading at all. Yep. Just a tiny little bit there. Yep. And then we want to leave this to prove for a little bit. Now it doesn't need to approve for as long as our, our normal dough, because okay. um, we're not wanting, you know, in pizza, especially in wood-fired pizza, you get those beautiful bubbles around the crust. Yes. That's that's from allowing it to rest for a long time. Okay. And then with the flatbreads, we're after for more of a crisp bread. Right. So you don't want big bubbles all over. Exactly. So we'll just leave it for maybe maybe 20 minutes, 30 yep. minutes, um, just till a bit's increase in size by about 25%. Uh, so one one thing actually I'd like to point out uh, is. Some people get a little bit concerned about the front, the floor of the oven getting dirty. And because I, I can see all the juices like mm, dripping out mm. of this eggplant onto the floor. And that is not a problem for us at all. Okay, if I, if I was worried about how the floor looked here, I could rake the coals forward, say at the end of the cook. Mm -hmm. I could rake all the coals forward onto those tiles and it would actually burn all of the stains out of the floor. I would say they're pretty much ready now. This is what we're after, where the, the skin is kind of like a shell around yep. the, the eggplant, yep. and you can really feel the mushiness of that, that awesome. inside flesh. Awesome. Now be really careful, because they, they are very, very soft when you're pulling them out. You do not want them to just you know fall onto the floor or, or break a little bit off. Try and grab the entire eggplant at once. Sounds like something bad happened to you. Many bad things have happened while using the <laughs> oven. I've had many burns and many disappointing meals. <laughs> but that's all part of the fun. It's exactly, part, it's yeah. It's part of the learning. No. We get asked a lot of the time, oh, how, how do we cook in it? And hey, I think these videos are going to help with that. Yes, yes. But it's, it's having a crack. Mm. Like, just, just give it a go. Exactly. And burn a few things and, and learn from it. That's it, that's yeah. it. All right, so now we've got these out. We just want to get the, the skin off and get it into the colander. So yeah, we just want to peel the skin back. It doesn't matter if you get a little bit of the skin in there, it's just going to add to the flavor. But Ben, can you smell that smokiness that's coming off here? Oh yeah. Oh, how good does that, that smell? That's awesome. So you can have a look here. This is what you're after. See how it's, it's just, it's like mush. Wow. Yeah, that, that literally, it's there's, just falling there's probably apart. a very chef-y word for that, but mush seems to Mush is the well perfect description. Now you can just use your hands to do this. Um, if they're still a little bit hot, you can just wait for them to cool down. So I'll just pick it up, put it over the colander, and just scrape out all of that stuff. It should, it should essentially just fall out though. Wow. These will get you just. That smells amazing. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. You can just really smell that smokiness mixed with the already delicious smell of eggplant anyway. Why the colander? Why not just scrape this? Because you want to get you want to get all of, see all this juice that's here? Yes. You want to get all of this juice that's in there, you want to get it out. Right. Otherwise, you're just going to end up with this really runny kind right. of dip. Okay. You want it to, you know, you don't want to have that dip consistency. Okay. Okay. Not, not a soup. Exactly. Exactly. 
So you can leave a little bit of the skin in here, but you want to try and get the, the majority of it out. We'll just set this aside and leave it to drain all that liquid out yep. um, and to cool down a bit before we make our dip. So that's what we're after. It's, it's very, very soft. And when, even, the, even the spoon will just cut through it as well. Gorgeous. All right, so we've got our flatbread dough here. It's been sitting for maybe about 10, 15 minutes just while we've been prepping our eggplant and we want to roll it out. So to do that, we're just going to need a little bit of flour in our board. Now with the flatbread, you can just make it whatever shape you like. I, I just kind of like a nice round shape. Um, so this is just going to be one big This is going to be one, one big awesome. flatbread that we just chop up. Yep. Um, oh. Just chop up and serve. I am so hungry right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm a big advocate for a bit more of a random shape. I don't like, like even perfect. with my pizzas, I don't go for a perfectly round pizza. Okay. I don't know, I think it looks a bit weird, but that's, that's yep. my preference. Okay. So I'll just kind of fold this out in any direction. Just use a bit of gravity to help. It's about kind of getting that, that even thickness. Yep. Um, like you don't want you don't want thick edges like you would on a pizza. You want it all to be very consistent. Okay, so it's quite thin through the middle. Is that okay? Yeah. So I'm get, that's why I'm going to try and thin down those edges. Yep. Oh, it does look yummy. Yep. It's a bit weird and misshapen. Exactly. Like the guy who's making it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, had a, it's had a weird and strange life. Cool. So we've got our tray here. Okay. We'll do, just you, use... do, you need, yeah. do you need to put oil on that or something? I'll just put a little to... bit of oil, exactly. Just a bit of spray oil so it doesn't stick. The reason I'm doing this on a tray rather than straight into or onto the stones of the oven yep. is because I can't be bothered cleaning it right now because we're, you know, we're going to be doing other things with the coals. We're going to be moving that fire around lots. So we don't want to be you know, completely cleaning it to cook dough and then putting cold straight back on it. Right, so because so you could sweep the floor and cook this right on the bricks. Exactly. So put it on a, yep, uh, yep. get it onto like a wooden board and shuffle it on Like the you would floor. a pizza, like we're going to do with the pizza. But we don't need to do but that, we, we can just cook it on the tray. Exactly, this okay. is kind of entrees, you don't want to have to be cleaning it and then dirtying it again, there's no point. Yep. So we'll just get our, get our dough, and just place it on our tray. <laughs> I've just, I've given you a tray that's just big enough. <laughs> if you have a really nice big tray, it does, it does help, but it's not the end of the world. Oh. As I said, we're going to chop this all up afterwards, so the shape and stuff doesn't really affect it. Yep. And then with that, we'll just slide that into the oven. Try to keep um, a little bit closer to the mouth of the oven because we're not wanting that really, really high direct heat on it. It's still a bread, it's still going to burn very quickly. How long is this going to take to cook? Only a couple of minutes. Maybe right. five minutes at the max. Full attention. Full I'll attention for this. I'll let you turn this. the timer on and go wander away. Definitely not, yeah. no. And you're going to have to turn it, I'm guessing, on the spot. Yes, that, yes. That side that's closest. Just like cooking a pizza, you've got radiant heat on one side. Yep. So you have to rotate it, otherwise you're just going to have black half and a raw half. Okay. That's not what we want. That's not what we want. So what I'm looking for is some rising in the, in the base. So you can see just here, yeah, we've got a little bubble there. Yeah. That means that the bottom is cooking really nicely. Yeah, beautiful. So as it starts to puff up like that, I'm gonna rotate it so that the other look side is getting. That. Look at that just coming up here. That's cool. So I really wanna make sure that oh, our other side that. is still cooking. Already got some brown in it. You can so, see how fast it's cooking, and we're right in the mouth of the oven that's, right now. That's the other thing. I think people, uh, people who've never used a wood fire oven before often think, right, all the cooking happens right inside the oven. Yeah. You've got to put it right to the back, and you don't. Like, it's no. hot here. Exactly. Well, it's hot. You can feel it. It's hot right here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so even when I say, when we do our steak, yep. you'll see when, we, when we're resting our steak, we'll pull it right out, and we'll actually sit it on the front here. Yes. So we're still getting some heat, but it's not cooking anymore, if that makes cool. sense. So now that we've kind of got a nice browning over the top, so you can see that it's, it's crisping up on this side. We've still got a little bit of cooking to do. Um, and one thing that makes it really easy to flip it, because it'll be stuck a little bit to the base right now, is just give it a sharp tap. So you just put it here, just give it a, a nice little whack like that. You don't want to use 
your partner's best pan. No, definitely, definitely never use best pans in the oven. Never use, okay. Unless they're like solid techniques pans where they're designed to go into wood fire ovens or cast iron pans. Yep. yep. Never use okay. pans that aren't sacrificial pans. Right, gotcha. All right. So now you're going to turn that over? I'll turn it over. So I'll just get under here and just flip that over. Nice. And we'll just get that back in there and let this side crisp up a little bit more too. Beautiful. That's done. That is, that is done right there. Fantastic. Yep. We'll put that on our board yep. or you can put it aside and serve it when you're ready. Okay. Alrighty, now finishing off our eggplant dip. Uh, the first thing we're gonna have to do is chop up some shallots. Mm -hmm. um, that's just gonna add a bit more flavor. And we just want these really finely diced so that you're not getting a big chunk of shallots, sorry. Don't cry, Marcus. Don't, 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 don't let them see you cry. <laughs> Right. Okay guys, uh, so I'm filling in for Marcus, whose eyes are just, he's had some really terrible news. <laughs> really sad. Why don't you tell me what to do? All right, I'll so just because you look dice up hilarious. the garlic. Alright, so dice this up. Alright, I can do that. You can tell he's an engineer. What? Just by his cutting skills. <laughs> is it how I hold the knife? What is it? Or is it, I just don't have great cutting skills? That's very rude! I am just the you. <laughs> perfect, that is perfectly done now. It's done. So don't yep. need, that's so you're after the same, kind of the same size you are for your shallots with the garlic. So you're saying that's perfectly that is, diced. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> all right, so we can just put all that together. Um, so what I'm doing here is just trying to get rid of any of that last moisture that's just resting in there. Okay. So I'll just try and kind of push it through. And this is also helping to break up that eggplant a little bit more as well. Beautiful. All right. Now that we've got our eggplant in there, it's time to add our garlic and our shallots. So I'll probably put just three little teaspoons of this, of the shallots, and maybe half of that garlic. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then you just want to incorporate all those ingredients. So just mix them together. Now we want to add just one teaspoon of mayonnaise to start off with again. Always doing, I do pretty much everything to taste. Mix that through. So that's looking pretty good. Now we'll just add a pinch of salt. Now we need the canola oil. All right, Ready? so you want to just a really slow drizzle. This is where the Guilford shakes are really come in yeah, handy. it's really helping. Look at that. Drizzle it, drizzle it. And it's a lot more canola oil than you would actually expect to go into one of these. And it gives it a really nice consistency. How do we know, like, uh, I'm drizzling, right? Yep. I have no idea how much I've added. Are it's, we looking for something? It's about a quarter of a cup, and we're looking for it to become that, that dip consistency. That's okay. essentially what the canola oil is allowing it to become. Okay, so it's, it becomes a dip consistency, not from the mixings per se, like it's not being blitzed. Exactly. It looks like it's, it's softening up and it's, separating. It's both of those things. It's, it's the, the, the mixing mm -hmm. and the canola oil is okay. getting us that consistency. And now we'll give that a taste. And this is where we'll just start adding little bits of our ingredients until it's essentially the taste that we're after. Yep. The last thing we need for our, our kind of entree is our cheese. Now this is just a, just a simple triple cream brie. Just simple. Just a simple, that's it. That's all we go for here, simple. Um, so all we need for this is our brie, a little bit of garlic, some rosemary and some oil. And you want to put a little crosses or around the, the cheese and that's just so you can kind of insert the garlic and allow it to infuse with the cheese. Okay. So how I do this is just put a little cross and I probably put about five or six going around the cheese. Do you put them near the center or towards the? I'll do both. Edges? I'll put I'll put uh, more around the edges because okay. that's going to heat up faster, and you're going to get a good cooking. Like, yep. You know, you're going to get a good infusion with the garlic. Yep. The center is going to stay a little bit harder, and so I'll put a very thin piece of garlic in there just to get the flavor in there. Yeah, okay. um, but so it doesn't, you know, you don't get a big chunk of raw garlic. Yep. And this, honestly, this is one of my favorite things to cook in the oven. It's so easy. Yep. It's such a crowd pleaser. Um, it's amazing. So that's all ready. I'll just put that aside there and get my garlic. Now you probably only need one good, decent sized clo clove of garlic for this because you're going to slice it up into small pieces. Okay. Just little tiny, little Like slivers. Slices, little slivers. 
So you're gonna, we're you're just gonna put those into the cheese. Exactly. So yeah, we're just gonna cheese. get the raw garlic like this. We're gonna just push it into the cheese with a little bit sticking out. Yeah. I literally, as soon as I started doing this, I haven't stopped doing it at any time that somebody comes over. Now to prep our pan, is get a little bit of oil, and I place it in there. And I just rub it around a bit to spread that oil around. Uh. We're using these solid techniques pans. These are made in Australia. Um, they are so they're locally made. They're gorgeous. They're, these are actually pressed steel, mm. uh, so they have a lot of the benefit of cast iron. So they've got really even heat distribution, but they're not that heavy. No, cast exactly. Cast iron ones break your arm. Yes, like, yes. You need, you need manly wrists mm. for those. Uh, but the other thing is, they've got no plastic. So if you're if you're wanting to do this kind of thing in your oven at home, hey. You just need something that doesn't have anything combustible on it. Now it's just a little bit of rosemary um, and it will do a drizzle of oil on top as well. So with the rosemary, I just want a nice fresh rosemary, preferably. Um, and it's literally just putting it on top. We're almost wanting the, the, the rosemary to char and to start smoking. And that'll allow, that'll get some of that rosemary flavor kind of infused in there. Awesome. All right, the last thing we do is just a bit of oil over the top. Now this is just a, a little drizzle. Mm. Beautiful. And that's what you're after. You want to be very careful with the cheese though that you're, you are watching it very closely because it cooks very fast. So I'll, I'll just put it in there kind of on just after the mouth of the oven. And you can already hear, it's only been in there a few seconds, you can already hear the oil starting to sizzle. Yes. Um, so that's, you're just gonna be so careful with it. Yeah. Um, try, and you need to make sure you're rotating it so you get that beautiful, you, it'll start to puff up, yep. get like almost swollen and a bit charred and you wanna make that sure that's even around the whole okay. cheese. So you'll see here, I'm just slowly rotating it, just making sure that we're getting even cooking around it. Yep. Um, and if I pull it out, you can see that it's already starting to get swollen yep. around and this side. that little brown. Little browning. Oh, and you can that. already feel that it's quite soft. Yep. Okay, so I can see some smoke. Looks like there's a bit of smoke coming off the rosemary. And that's what I was saying before. We want that rosemary yeah. to start smoking for this yep. exact reason. Yep. Beautiful. All we got to do now is we'll just pick off this little bit of rosemary on the top. It's blackened. Oh, look at that. And we're just really carefully, now making sure that you do not touch the pan with your bare hands, because that is still incredibly hot. Beautiful. 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 Now we'll just garnish that with a little bit of nice fresh rosemary. Yeah, this is always, it's, as I said before, it's always a crowd pleaser. A crowd stopper? A crowd stopper, a crowd pleaser. It does anything to crowds, it's yeah, amazing. It does things to crowds. <laughs> crowds can't resist it. What well, do you reckon? Well done, man. It's come around. It, it looks, it looks brilliant. It looks amazing. What I want to reiterate for you guys is, we were doing all that cooking in an oven that was heating up. Uh, it was an oven that was already hot. It had been slowly heating up, uh, and so we were using the heat on the way up. We were cooking exactly. yep. on the yep. way up. Um, and, and so, because I know a question that you'll be saying is, oh, what temperature did you do the cheese at? It doesn't matter. If, it, if the oven had been a little cooler, it would have taken a little longer, yep. we would have got the same result. Um, so you don't need to know the exact temperature yep. uh, for that kind of cooking. The oven's, the oven's hot now. So actually another question we get all the time is, well, you don't, I don't have a gauge in the oven. How do I know how hot it is? And there's a few things that you can do. Uh, and one of the things that I do really regularly is I just look at the dome. So when you fire the oven up, it starts off all, it goes all black. Uh, and when you clear 350 degrees Celsius, all of that soot, that black soot will just burn off and the dome becomes white. Uh, and so when the dome is white, you know you're at least at 350, maybe a little higher, and that's a great temperature for doing pizza, uh, which is what I believe you're about to do now. Exactly, yep. So we've just pulled the, the dough off the back of the oven, and you can see here that it's probably even more than doubled in size. This is, this is what we're oh, after. Oh, look at that. See that beautiful look dough? Look at that. Let's just... Now, if I have some flour on my fingers so it doesn't stick, you'll be able to see that much better. So it's, it's, it's not bouncing it's back not up bouncing at you. It's not bouncing back, and that's what we're after. Okay, good. Um, perfect. So our dough is pretty much ready. We'll just put that aside still, and we're going to get our passata ready, or our, our tomato base. 
Um, so you can just do this in the oven as well, and that's the kind of the point, or one of the points we're trying to get across is that you can do anything in the oven. Like I've done stir fries in there before, I've done a bolognese in there before, um, and today we're going to do a passata. So I've just got my, my pan here. Um, all I'm going to need is some garlic, some, I've just got some fresh bay leaf, but you can use dry bay leaves as well, some rosemary, um, and just some herbs, and of course salt and pepper. Alright, so we're just going to cut our garlic up. We want to cut this up nice and finely. Got our garlic chopped up. We'll get our rosemary. I like to just get all of the, the ingredients ready. Um, so especially when I'm cooking the oven when stuff can happen really, really quickly. If you've got everything ready, it's much easier than trying to like have it in there and then rush back to try to finish something else off. Okay, um, so you do all your prep first. First, exactly. Yep. So, We've got, our, we've got our garlic, we've got our rosemary, we've got our bay leaves. We just need, um, we've got a little bit of basil peel and a little bit of oregano. Um, and then all we're needing is a bit of oil, our passata, and a tiny little bit of wine. Um, any wine is fine. Okay. Uh, I think the, a, a darker, richer wine is probably... But a, a red? A red yeah, wine? A red wine. Okay. Alright, so we've got our pan here. We'll just get a little bit of oil in there. And we'll get our garlic. We'll get all of our herbs in. So we've got our garlic, our rosemary, and our bay leaves. So you're putting the rosemary in also, like you're not chopping that, you're gonna pull that out later. I'll pull that out later. Right, okay. All right, so we wanna make sure that we don't burn our garlic, because that, that's not a very nice flavor in there. Mm. Um, just getting, you can, almost, you can start to smell it now, that aroma coming off it. And this will kind of infuse that rosemary and bay leaf into the oil as well. So you're gonna leave the rosemary and bay leaf in there and put the sauce in Correct. and cook yeah. it. Okay. We'll literally pull the bay leaf and rosemary once the, the sauce is finished At and we're end. ready to put it on the pizzas. And okay. We'll pull it out. You can see the garlic isn't completely brown. We've just got a nice tinge to it and um, the herbs have nicely infused with all of the oil. So what we're going to do after that is chuck in our, our tomato base, our passata, um, and just a, just a whole jar of this is fine. As, as much as you're making. Oh, so you just want to mix all that around. All right. So this is the stage where you can pretty much add everything in and we're just wanting to let it cook for a bit. Let okay. all those flavors develop. Yep. We'll just add a little bit of oregano and a little bit of uh, dried basil. So maybe just a pinch of each. A decent pinch though, because we want that flavor to come through. Beautiful. And then our wine as well. So once we've got all those ingredients nicely mixed in, We'll just set it just past the, the mouth of the oven. All right, so we've got our passatas cooking away in there. We've got to make sure we're keeping an eye on it. But in the meantime, we can get our dough finished off. So it's been sitting, as I said before, it's been sitting on the back of the oven and it has beautifully proved more than doubled in size. To get it ready for pizzas, all we're going to do, we're not going to separate it into little balls and then let it re-rest. We're okay. just going to take it straight from the, the mother dough, if you want to call it that. Yep. So we'll just get a little bit of our flour <clears throat> put it onto a board here so we can get our dough down to the board easier to chop easier to move around okay so getting a little bit of flour on your fingers just grab that dough it doesn't matter if you start to collapse the dough at all don't worry about that that's called degassing that's absolutely fine mm. and literally until we're ready to fully make our pizza we'll just leave it like that That'll just allow it to rest for a little bit longer, allow it to relax. Yep. In the meantime, we'll just finish off our passata. It should be nearly ready now. Um, and then we can get to making our, our margarita. All right, so our passata's been in there for about 10 minutes now. And it's, mm. you can see where that line, where it was sitting at, it's dropped down a, a, about a centimeter. So it's, it's a lot thicker now. Yeah. It's, that's where we're wanting it to be. So we'll just pour that into our bowl here. Next thing we want to do is get our base all rolled out. Um, very, very easy. It's, it's been there to relax for maybe another five minutes. So with this part of the process, we want to use a fair bit of flour on our base, just so that the dough doesn't stick to the base at all. You can really make your, your pizza as small or as big as you like, it doesn't matter at all. You just want to be really delicate with it when you're, when you're trying to roll it out. What I'm trying to do is press out from the center and keep a fairly a fairly high edge and that's going to allow you know that really nice bubbly the, crust the around the outside. Crust. Okay, exactly. Cool, yeah. Cool. So yep. we're not going to roll it. You're just going to push just it out. Just going to push it edges. out exactly. Okay. And use and use some gravity to do it as well. So just by picking it up 
and kind of rotating the dough like this. Yep. Holding on to those kind of thicker edges. Mm -hmm. That's going to allow that 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 center to stretch out a bit okay. more. Okay. Now, what happens if you get a little tear? So we've got like a little yep. tear here. Anything we can do about that? I'll show you. So I can make that tear nice oh, and big. Oh, no! And then to fix that, yes. like this, this happens to me regularly. Okay, because that happens to me, and that's usually chef. like a deal break. I'm like, pizza's ruined. <laughs> right? Literally all I do is yeah. get it and fold it back and press that back in. Okay. If it's not sticking to itself again, you can get just a, like say you've got a little cup of water, yep. dip your finger in there, rub that on there as well. And to, and to make the it dough, sticky again. The dough okay. will okay. stick that, back. That's, that's a really great tip because the number of times that I've done this where I've, I've pushed it out, and then I pick it up and I, I'm turning it, turning it, and I just, and just see this. I see it go like window pane. I'm yeah. like, oh, oh no! And then it's, it's a tear. Yeah. And the thing is, if you if you put the sauce on that, and then you try and get that in the oven, oh, you're going to have a, a bad nightmare. time. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yep. it, it just the sauce goes straight through onto the floor. Then you can't get the pizza peel under mm -hmm, it. It's, mm -hmm. it's bad news. So you can tell that I'm into the the rustic the look. That is a rustic look. Yeah. It is. It it's is. not even close to exactly. Being all right, so we've got our base all ready. We'll just get a little bit more flour on there and now we'll get it onto our peel. So we, I've, I use a couple of different peels. I use a peel for working in the oven and then I use one for placing pizzas in the oven. So ah. it's very hard to make a pizza on that because of it's on an angle. Yes. It doesn't sit on the bench very well. And Much you can only, well, generally there. speaking, you have one of these. Exactly. You don't have five. Yep. And you might have a bunch of guests if you're making every one and putting it onto this, it's kind of limiting. Mm -hmm. Or if somebody's cooking and, and yes. somebody else is making the pizzas, yep. it's very hard if they need They the need peel. this. I'm just gonna use a tiny little bit of semolina on here to kind of act as ball bearings underneath the pizza base, allowing yep. it to just really easily slide off into the oven. This is a really good tip. And look, there's you could read for hours on the interwebs about semolina and should you use it or shouldn't you? If you're going to be really quick with your base, if your base is literally going onto a board and into the oven, you can get away without anything yes. because you're going to be quick. But if you're going to take any anything more than a minute or so, mm. it really helps having something underneath to stop it from sticking to the yep. timber. And I think also if you've got a really thin base, like if you're if the th center of your base is quite thin, yes. the, the sauce will will soak through it a bit faster. Yeah. And then that will cause and, it to and stick. And I'm as seeing well. that with your, your base there. Uh, there are some sections that are quite thin. Yeah. Yep. So the semolina is probably going to be a good idea. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Carry on. So we've got this. We'll get this flipped onto the onto the board here. So we're just going to put a small amount of passata in the center. Now, I haven't taken the rosemary and bay leaves out. You're just being Because I'm brave. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to put this straight on here, just a little bit, and then you just want to rotate that around to try and cover the entire base. Oh, that looks good. So this is beautiful, beautiful buffalo mozzarella that we've got from Paran Market. Mm. And we'll just put Spoiled. a few chunks of this on. We are spoiled for produce here in Melbourne. Oh yeah. That's so good. And then one last trick I like to tell people is when you're using basil, if you want to put your basil into the oven and cook it on the pizza, a really good idea is to put a little bit of olive oil in your basil bowl. Um, so this, this, is, just, this is fresh basil? This is fresh basil. Because I do find when I put basil on, generally it'll just go black. Goes black, exactly. Yeah. This will, it'll still go dark, but this will just allow it to like retain its flavor. Okay. Um, now this basil is they're very small leaves, but we'll just leaves. put put a lot on, and it'll be delicious. And now just another little bit of olive oil on the actual pizza itself. Don't ask me what this does. I just see lots of pizza restaurants <laughs> doing it. And I've never tried not to do it. So. <laughs> and another little trick I like to do is just to oh, shake yeah. my pizza on the board itself to make sure that I do have some. Some, Some movement, movement there, yeah, exactly, because yeah, yeah. I don't want to be putting my arm in the oven, try to shake it off and nothing happens. That, yeah. that is, uh, that's not now a fun Now before time. we put it in, before we put oh, it in, yes. we nearly just made a rookie error. We would need to clean the floor of the oven. So the oven's good and hot. We just need to give ourselves a nice clean area to cook on. All right, and so we like to brush the floor down. Uh, you can mop it. The brush works really well though. Let's get that pizza in the oven before Let's do it, it sticks. So it's been on there a little bit longer than we like, so we'll just give it another shake. I think that is stuck there. Oh, so she's good. And I'm using my Guildford shakes to 
<laughs> help shake it off the actual peel as I'm sliding it back. The other thing you'll notice is most of the semolina is still on the board. So we're not actually gonna end up eating that much of the semolina that was on the base of the pizza. Most of it's left on here. But if not for that semolina, I reckon that base would have, that oh, would have been one of those stuck. ones where you go, and, and all the, the toppings come off. Ah, yeah, 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 exactly. So oh. what, I'm, what I'm looking for is the edges to puff up really nice and quickly. Now this is gonna cook amazingly fast. The oven is super hot in there. Yep. And I, I can probably say that the bottom of this is already pretty much cooked which means we can actually take it off and start rotating and playing okay, with it. Okay. Until the, the bottom of the base is actually cooked, you won't be able to move the pizza because you you'll just it. tear through it. Yeah, exactly right. This is, the other thing that you'll learn from cooking a whole bunch of pizzas is to put your first pizza fairly close to the mouth of the oven because the floor is really hot. Yeah, and look at uh, that. It's kind of yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's gorgeous. Now again, this is not a video on how to cook pizza. Um, there's some, there's lots and lots of videos out there on how to cook the perfect pizza. Um, but man, that is looking good. The other thing that we would normally do, uh, that I totally forgot to do, Marcus, is put the fire to the side. If you're cooking with the fire at the back, what happens is you, you can't see as easily the edge of the pizza that's closest to the fire. And so that cooks faster. Uh, and if you have the fire to one side, you can see the edge that's cooking, and so you'll know when to turn it. All right, beautiful. So that is beautifully cooked. You just saved it as well, a tiny little hole formed, but you <laughs> recovered it, nicely done. That looks amazing. And you're right about the basil. It's, it's still got a bit of green in it. It's exactly. still got some color in it. It'll have much more of its flavor. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Well, shall we eat? I think we need to cut that up and eat Let's it. Let's do it. It's on to the, the best bit. This is the, the steak, steak and veg, I guess. Um, so what we're gonna do is we got, we got some potatoes here, we got a little melody of carrots, we've got some garlic, we've got some shallots, rosemary, and of course, our, our steak, which That's... is gonna be amazing. So I find cooking in the wood-fired ovens, the, the best kind of meats to do are really thick meats. Okay. And you just, you just have a little bit more time. That's, that is the, that's the crucial thing that I feel. Like yep. when you're doing a really thin steak, just like a steak you get from Woolies or Coles or something, yep. they just cook so fast that it's hard to kind of get that, that perfect well, cook on them. You're also cooking differently. It's not like cooking on a pan over the stove or exactly. even over, over flame. Yep. Yep. You've got heat from above yeah. and below. It's like a stove that's in an oven almost, yes. 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 <laughs> essentially. Yeah. So, and, and I really want to get that oven super hot and we're cooking directly over the coals. You'll actually see our steaks gonna light a fire completely. Yep. As you can see by my face, this is my favorite thing to cook. Okay. Meats. Meats in the wood fire oven, you'll, you'll never come across something better. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna prep our carrots. Um, our carrots are just gonna go on a really, a really thin pan here. We call this the, this is a Solid Technics griddle pan. Um, I really like it for cooking carrots just because it's nice and low. You get that heat coming in from all angles um, and they'll cook a little bit faster, which is, which is good for carrots. So we're probably not gonna use all of these for today. Um, we just want, we want them to be all a similar size as well, just so that they get even cooking. If you have some variance, it's not too bad. As in, so if you had a giant thick carrot Correct. in amongst all these, that would be a problem. It would, yeah, it okay. would just never cook, okay. you know, and then, yep. or it would cook, but these little tiny ones would be black. They'd, they'd be, be gone. They'd be embers, yeah, yep. yeah. So that's probably a good amount. Maybe we'll just grab a couple more, because we're hungry. Um, and we want to chop the ends off, but still leaving it a very small amount, very small bit of that stalk there. And just as an example, probably just like that. Just that tiny little knob at the, the top there. That's, yep. We'll keep that. Yep. Um, so we'll just put those aside and prep all these. All right, so we've got those all ready. Now we'll prep our, our pan here. So all we're doing, a little bit of olive oil. Get one carrot, just drag that olive oil around just so you're not having any bits that are, that are gonna be dry. And then putting all those carrots on. Now I like to put them all in one direction just so that I can control the char on the really thin side. I can yep. rotate the pan to be around, you know, so that all the thick ends are on one side or all yep. the thin ends are on one side. It just gives me more control over the cook. Perfect. 
So get a little bit more olive oil over the top of them. Beautiful. Now we're just going to have a bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. So in this I'll strip a little bit of the rosemary, get some of those the little leaves on, and then I'll just put a couple of chunks on there as well. And again with the, the rosemary, if you add oil to the rosemary, it's, it's going to stop it from burning really right. fast. So I'll just yep. put a little bit of oil on there as well so I'm getting more of the flavour rather than the smokiness. And I don't want to put these in individually, I want to put all of our vegetables in at the same time so that we get... So that's done, you, that's you prep done. that, that's... and so now you prep the next exactly. thing. Exactly. And, and a really good part about this is you can prep all of this hours in advance. Doesn't okay. matter. It can sit on the table there for for an hour, maybe two hours. That'll yep. be absolutely fine. You can fine. put that in the fridge if you're worried about it. Exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's the beauty of it. It's like when you're, say, if you were just doing steaks, when your oven's heating up, you can have all of your trays prepped and ready to go. Um, and then as soon as it's at the right temperature for you, start cooking it all at Fantastic. once. Fantastic. All right, so we're going to prep our potatoes. So we're just going to get a little bit of oil in our pan here. This is one of the 30 centimeter pans by Solar Technics. Yeah, this, this is, is my favorite. I, a fantastic. You can pan. see this pan has had a lot of use. I use it for everything. So with these, I want to chop them into to essentially wedges. Okay. Um, I find they, they cook really nicely in the oven. So what are you making? You're making potato chips. Potato chips, essentially. Yeah, yeah. awesome. But straight in the oven. No need to like pre-boil them, parboil them or whatever. Yep. Um, you just chuck them straight in. So I'm just chopping them in half quarters and then I'm dividing those quarters in half but when I cut these I'm not cutting from the the angle there if that makes sense I'm cutting from a little bit to the side of the angle so that I get an even even cut for the two oh, chips. So you, you're going for flat sections? Well essentially so that both of these sections are going to be about the same amount of potato. Okay. So yep. they cook evenly. Okay. Uh, again moving our oil around so that we get a nice even coating and then what I'll do is I like to stand all the potatoes up and you can really make these as thin as you would like. I wouldn't go much thicker than this because it would just won't cook in time. Like it'll yep. be it'll be black on the outside. But how by long the time are these going to take? They, these are you know these are pretty thick yep. chips. So these uh, like in the oven at this kind of temperature, these will still only take five to ten minutes. Okay. And then what we'll do with them while we're while we're cooking the steak is we'll have them at the mouth of the oven so that yep. they can just continue to cook a little bit. Okay. Uh, but really keep their heat as the main part of that while we're cooking the steak. Because the steak, even in the oven with all of that heat, will yep. still take like, again, five to 10 minutes. Okay. Wait, the steak's only gonna take five to 10 minutes to cook? That thickness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, it's very, very hot in there. Yeah, okay. Now a bit of garlic. Um, I'll probably just quarter these. Perfect. So we've got our potatoes in there, we've got our garlic. Now again, we'll just use a little bit of rosemary. I love rosemary. Check this out. And again, we'll rip, we'll rip oh, a bit off. Everywhere. Um, and we'll also chuck in some, some stem as well. I, d I love the smell of rosemary. Oh, me too. Now we just need a fair bit of salt. Yep. And some pepper. Now we're not going to be eating all of that salt. A lot of it's just going to stay in the pan, just yep. like with oil as well. You never, you, I always put, use a fair bit of oil, but you never end up eating it all of it. A bit more olive oil on the top. So there we've got it. We've got our, got our potatoes ready. We've got our carrots ready. Mm. Let's get those in the oven. Beautiful. And we'll just leave those there for a while. They'll start to sizzle very quickly. So you're just shaking them up a bit. Yeah, shaking yep. them up. Moving them around, trying to get the, the, raw, the ones that look a bit rawer to the yep. front and keep the ones that are looking a bit more crisp to the back. You bring those to the back, okay. And then with the carrots, the same as well, but I do that more with rotating the, the tray than I do with rotating the carrots themselves. Yep. Oh, that looks So look awesome. at that, they're already coming. I'm actually yeah, gonna, yeah. what I'm gonna do with these, because I can see that they're cooking a bit faster than the than the potato, yep. what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna keep it closer to the front of the oven. Okay. So I'll just, using that spectrum of heat that we were talking about, yep. try to keep it in the yeah. cool area. Yeah, brilliant. While this is cooking, we can start prepping our steak. Nice. This is my favorite part. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't, I'm getting that. I need you to understand oh, this. I'm, I'm picking that up, yeah. All right, so this is a beautiful, beautiful steak. It's been dry aged for about four weeks. All right, we're just going to use a couple of things to season this, and yep. then while we're cooking it, we're going to be putting it with some butter, some more rosemary, because you know I love it. I, I know you love rosemary. Um, and we're going to be doing it on the grill and the pan, and then back to the grill. Nice. So to prep it, while our veggies are, are still cooking, we're just going to use a bit of salt, 
and we're going to get that. It's a, it's a fairly decent amount of salt. It's probably more than you would, you would usually expect. And what I'm going to do is, at the same time is salt the, the board. The reason why I'm salting or seasoning the board is so that I can roll the steak on its edges right. across the board yep. and make sure it's seasoned the entire way I was going to say, I was like, you, you cannot convince me that the board needs to be the seasoned. The board <laughs> is delicious too, trust me. <laughs> All right, so we've got salt, pepper, a fair bit of pepper as well. And making sure I pepper the board. Get that board seasoned. And then lastly is a little bit of garlic powder. Um, I love garlic powder and steak. It's so good. I was introduced to it not too long ago, maybe a few months ago, and I've never looked back. Wow. So just a little bit of that, a little bit on the board. So we'll just quickly give it a little rub. And we want to do the same to the other side. Do you need to put oil on at this point? No, See, no, we're not going to put olive oil on at all. I think, this. I think that was something that maybe, I don't know where I picked it up, but I was I always thought, oh, I've got to put oil yeah. on my meat. So with that, if you've got a leaner steak, yes. you want to put olive oil okay. because you need to introduce that fat. But you can see how much well, fat's that on fat. this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is going to go from this thick to like, you know, it's probably going to be three quarters of the size that it is. Okay. And so all of that reduction is going to be all of the fat kind of coming, coming out. out of it. Awesome. So salt, oh, pepper, pepper, and then garlic powder. Mm -hmm. Massage this side and then roll your edges. You don't need to worry about them being completely covered. You just want to get a bit of seasoning on those sides as well. Steak prepared. Done. Ready to go. How are our veggies? Now we'll just check on our veggies. Oh, and they are looking so good. So, so they're nearly done? They're pretty much done now. I'm just going to see when I'm pressing the tongs into them, they're compressing a little bit. Yep. And I can see that they're nice and soft on the it outside. It looks like you could cut them with the tongs right now. Exactly, yeah. Okay. But what I'm after is so when I, when I cut them, that there's a little hardness on the the inside. Now we don't want them to get cold, so what we're going to do, front of the oven. Okay. So it's like a warming rack. It's like a warming rack. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's perfect for Fantastic. that. Fantastic. And, and this is stuff, honestly, that uh, look people like myself, engineers, may not actually think of. Yes. Uh, not. I'm not saying engineers are dumb or something, but like it just might not occur to us. Oh yeah, I can. I can leave that here to mm, to keep mm. it warm. I think I've actually in the past, I have turned on the electric oven inside. Yep. You know, just to 80 degrees to keep things keep warm. Keep stuff warm, but yeah. I've done, that, I've done that before. Yeah. Um, but if you're just cooking a few things at once, this is a very easy way yeah. to do it. And the steak, what, it's going to be out in 10, 15 exactly. minutes. Exactly, we'll exactly. Be, we'll be eating that steak, right? Oh, we'll be eating that steak. Um, I'm not going home until I have that steak. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so our veggies are all done. You can see here the potato has a beautiful, nice brownness to it. As I squeeze it, I can feel that it's nice and soft. And I've just put our carrots in the same pan here, just so I can put them in the mouth of the oven um, and they will stay warm and ready for our steak. So let's get on to cooking that piece. Oh. We're gonna pull all the coals forward. We wanna really, like, pretty much superheat that grill. Okay. We want it to be as, as, as hot as we can get it. So okay. what we'll do is we'll just quickly put our veggies down for a second. Yep. They're not gonna get too cold sitting there. Okay. And yeah, if you could bring all those coals right to the front of the oven for so me. Just bring that, bring that up to here. Alrighty, those coals have all been brought forward. Now we're just going to shimmy our grill through there. So pick that up. It's nice and cool now from before. So we're going to shimmy that over the coals. Now we want them, as I said just now, we want to get those as super, this as super heated as we can. Um, that way we're going to get a really nice, you know, those char the lines. Sear. Those okay. really nice char yep. lines on our steak. So that, what, we need to give it about, what, a few minutes for, to heat Just up? a couple of minutes. I mean, the coals there are really, really hot. Yep. Um, at home, I would actually grab my little, my little fan um, and I would actually oh. super heat them right now. What, like your, 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 your blow dryer that you use in your hair? No, my, no I don't actually own a blow dryer. <laughs> sure you don't. Sure you don't. <laughs> Car Sorry, carry on. Yeah. No, my, my um, what are they called? Like a, like a, a leaf, leaf blower. Like a leaf blower. Like a small right, leaf blower. small blower. leaf blower. Exactly, okay, exactly. Okay. And just that, to get it going. Get, get those coals really going, but we can just leave it for a few minutes and that'll do exactly the same thing. Yeah, patience or a leaf blower. Exactly, exactly. Alrighty, the last thing I'm going to do to prep this fire is just bring the couple of logs that are on fire right up to the back of the grill. Because what, I want, what I'm wanting to do is when we get our steak in there, and the fat actually starts to boil out all of the steak. Yes. I want it to light on fire because I really want to get the you know the outside of that steak really nice and charred. Um, we're keeping the center okay. at that beautifully. Charring cooked. things is something that these ovens can do. Now it's time to cook our beast. So 
We'll just bring, we'll get our tongs, our long set of tongs. Yes. Thank you. We've got our pan ready here with just a, just a drizzle of olive oil in there, ready to put our butter, rosemary and steak on. But for the steak to start off with, we're gonna go a minute on each side to really get that nice charring. Now, quite an important thing is that there's, there's two, obviously two sides of the steak. The side with more meat on it, the thicker side, that doesn't have the bone, I want to be deeper into the oven so that I, I have that heat, you know, that heat there. Okay, so you want the heat on the meat. Exactly, the heat on the meat rather than on the bone. So no oil, just our seasoning, straight onto the grill. And I usually count down a minute in my head um, because it only needs about a minute per side to get that, those really, really nice grill lines. Yep. So this is something that I've definitely just had trial and error with. Like I've spent a lot of money on meat and <laughs> steak and I've ruined a lot of steaks and I'm a bit sad about it. But this method that I've got now, especially with a steak of this thickness, about, what's that, about 60 mil? That's, it's a good 60 mil, yeah. Um, this works every time. Okay. As long as having a thermometer is yes. incredibly important. Okay. You know exactly, if, as long as you're going into the thickest part of the meat, you know that what temperature you're waiting for until you take it out to rest, yep. um, and then so forth. So it's been about a minute now. We'll, we'll we're, we're totally gonna check that against the camera. Yeah, it's not gonna be a minute. <laughs> I reckon it was about a minute 18. <laughs> and that's okay. Right, if you're right that's, there, that's okay. Can I guess? A minute, I'm gonna go a minute 30. It's a minute 30. Closest without going over. Yeah. Let's yeah. find out. Oh, look at that. You didn't lie about the flames. So this is because all of that fat has started to, to come out. That's to, why to it's, it's like re rendering. rendering the yeah, fat. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Yep. Oh. And that's not that's not a problem. A lot of time when you go to restaurants, that's the difference between a restaurant steak and a steak you cook at home. Yes. Is that they're cooking over a grill and it's getting that char. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you really notice the different the difference in flavour. And uh, this is uh, something that we, we love people to see. Uh, look, before you saw it, we cooked a pizza. And by the way, we, we cooked one pizza. We could have kept going and cooked 50 pizzas, no, no problem. Um, but we wanted to show you, hey, a bunch of different things that we could cook. Um, and having, having the, 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 the Tuscan grill in the oven is brilliant because it gives you the opportunity to do stuff like this. Yeah, or even eggplant at the side of yeah, the Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Which would have, how would you have done that without the Tuscan I grill? I probably would have got like a cooling rack, sacrificed a cooling rack, okay. put it on two bricks and done the same thing. Yeah, okay. so. yep. Right, so what I've done here is I've just put in this pan with a little bit of olive oil and that's just to heat up the pan so that we're not putting the steak from being on a really hot grill onto the, the cold pan. Yep. I reckon that's been about over a minute now. I was gonna say, oh, like we're coming up to a minute. Can I grab that butter there, Mr. You Dean? You sure can. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna put the butter in, get our rosemary. If you break off a big old strand of that. Big old chunk of rosemary. All of that, just chuck it all in. All of that, all right. Yep. No worries. Perfect. And now we're gonna get our steak in there. You can see those beautiful, beautiful mm. grill lines. Now what I'm gonna do with the butter is just chuck it on top there because I want it to soak through. We want, we want to sit the rosemary in the butter to try and infuse it a bit more. Oh, and, yes. And you can see it's already got that beautiful char, but this is still going to be as raw as ever in the center, right. just being such a thick steak. Yep. But you know what we'll do? We'll just check the temperature on it, just to be on the safe side. So you can see here, what we're aiming for is about 55.5 degrees. So if I put that into our thickest part of the steak, only down into about the center, you'll see that we're still, at, we're still below 25 degrees, 22. We actually are about to go below 20 degrees, so we still got a while to cook there. Yep. Um, it just gives you a bit of reassurance. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that steak, would you cook that from straight out of the fridge? You really want your steak to be room temperature. Now, the reasoning behind that, not too sure. Again, it's one of those things that I've read in every single cookbook I've read or you know, book of, of the chefs that I've read that they leave their steak out and get it to room temperature. Yep. Um, so I what? do it. <laughs> <laughs> hey! That's, we don't, have, we don't have to like know everything from first exactly, principles, that's exactly. okay. <laughs> so again, we'll go about a minute on each side, a little bit longer, a little bit under, doesn't really matter. What we're after is for the rest of the steak to get that really nice char in it. And you'll see the butter just helps with that so much. And we want to keep basting it. So what I'll do every, every 30 seconds or so, I'll bring it out. I'll put it down here. 
and I'll just base it. I'll just get that butter and just put it over the top. Oh, look at that. And because this is the butter that's infused with the rosemary, we're going to get more of that, that rosemary flavor in there. That smells incredible. We'll actually turn this and you'll be able to see that, that extra charring that it's got. So mm. all between the, the grill lines, it's now got a beautiful brown color to it. And again, we'll base this side. Oh. So good. But while and we're here, we might as well check our temperature. There's no harm. And still below, as soon as I see the two, I'm like, yeah. Yep. Chuck it back in. Now I'll probably just leave it on there for another two minutes, bring it out, do the same thing again. Yep. Then we're actually gonna bring the grill back a little bit yes. and finish it off. And that's when we're really following those temperatures, checking every minute so or you're so. Bringing, when you say bring the grill back, back you bring it into the opening correct, a little bit. Correct, So you've got yep. a little bit more control. Exactly, so it's okay. still, it's like putting it into a conventional oven at that point. It's yep. still cooking, yes. but it's not over the grill where it's just gonna blacken straight away. Okay, cool, cool. You can see that rosemary's just gone off there. Hey. Um, with the pans as well, rosemary. they'll really retain that heat. So we'll do one more baste and then we'll chuck it back onto the grill. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, that's probably enough. Enough basting? Yeah, yeah. The burnt, maybe that burnt, the burnt rosemary maybe not. Exactly, yeah, we don't want to get the bitterness of that, that yeah, burnt butter okay. and burnt rosemary. So what we're just going to do now, as I said, we're going to put it on this side of the, of the grill. So just again with this, I'm always making sure that my thicker piece of meat is towards the front of the oven. And this is when we want to be really careful of our temperatures, taking them every couple of minutes. So I'll just put that in. So we're at 30, 34 degrees now. So I reckon we've got a couple of minutes left and then we'll be good to go. This is also a point where if you were, you know, if you wanted more char in your steak, you could put it over the flames again, get yep. more, get more yep. char. I like, the I, char. I like what you've got on I think, I think I, We've got enough from the butter and from that first, from that first. That, that really, it, like the butter, I didn't think it was going to char as much in the butter. It does. It makes but a it big does. difference, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you're right about the thickness of it. That was full. That was comfortably 60 mil thick when we yep. started, and it's, it's, it's dropped down at least to 50 mil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, the steak has just reached 55.5 degrees internal temperature, which means it is primed to be taken out and put onto the resting board. Look at that. That is amazing. That is a perfect amount of char. This is perfectly cooked on the inside, which we will see in a second when we chop it all open. Beautiful. But that is what we're after. And that it's just such a great example of something different that you can cook in the oven. Yes, it'll exactly. do pizzas. It'll do awesome pizzas. Yep. Baking, roasting, but hey, who, who would have thought to do a 60 mil thick steak? Exactly. Probably not me. So. At the highest temperatures as well. This isn't cooking on the way down. Yep. This is when you're at the max temperatures you can take your oven to. Recommended you, max temperatures. That's good, that's right. You can take, I melted aluminium in the oven recently, but I'm pretty sure that's a warranty voiding uh, exercise. <laughs> uh, you can actually take the ovens incredibly hot, but mate, great work. Well done. Thank you. I am looking forward to yeah, having some that, of this. Just a bit of salt. And that is ready to go. So that was awesome. Was I'm, actually, I'm yeah. really full now. <laughs> <laughs> we still have to do more cooking. Oh yeah. Um, now go. you probably wouldn't do this much cooking on all in one go, uh, but what we want to show you now is what we've done cooking on the way up. We've done cooking at the high temperatures. Now we want to show you some cooking on the way down. Uh, so the D105 behind us sitting at about 220 degrees, which is where I would expect to see it uh, let's say on Friday night, if I'd had pizza, it had been at 400 degrees. 
I'd be expecting it to be down about 220 by Saturday afternoon. Yeah. Uh, just in time for putting in a delicious roast for yeah. Saturday dinner. Exactly. So we're going to do uh, just a really, really basic pot roast. Um, now, the beauty of this is that you can kind of just use vegetables that you've got left over. So if you've got, you know, potatoes left over, pumpkin, carrots, onions, anything will go in this. We're going we're gonna to be chopping them up really nice and like big chunks. And we're going to put those down first. And that's going to kind of make a protective layer between the floor of the oven and the chicken itself. So the chicken is not going to be on the base of the pan. Not at all. Not it, at all. It'll, 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 the, the floor of the oven will still be quite hot. Exactly. A couple of hundred degrees. Exactly. And we want, so we want all of the, firstly, the chicken juices to come down through the vegetables, add some flavor. Yep. And protecting that bottom of the chicken, which doesn't have much meat on it in the first place. Yeah. From, from all of that, that floor heat. Oh, good point. Um, so let's get started. We've got, our, we've got our chicken here. We've just got a variety of vegetables that we kind of just had left over. We've got some garlic, some shallots, some onions, carrots, and potato. Um, and we're just gonna, we're gonna start with prepping our veggies, getting our pan ready. Then we'll finish off our chicken, which has already been washed and is ready to go. Um, pretty much chuck it on top, season it, bang it in the oven, and we'll get going. All right, so we'll just do our, our bigger vegetables first, and so we'll do our carrots. Um, so with these, we'll literally, again, just like the, the, um, the, the steak, we'll just chuck them in whole, chop off the bases. So we'll just get a little bit of olive oil in our, in our big pan here. Now this is uh, a beautiful pan by Solid Techniques. This is what they call the, the bigger skillet. Uh, so at the moment, uh, where things stand right now, this is the biggest uh, pan that they make. Uh, but it lends itself really well to doing roasts, things like that. We could have used a roasting like Could have roasting used a roasting pan. Pan. Could use a, like hey. a crock pot. Yep. There's a, there's a whole variety of things that you could use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. camp oven. Uh, the big cast iron camp ovens Perfect. would work just fine yep. for this as well. Yep. And these just really big chunks. It honestly doesn't. It doesn't get much easier than a, than a pot roast. You don't need to. You don't need to peel the potatoes or anything. Don't just, need to peel the potatoes. They're yeah. just nicely washed. Awesome. Now, while Marcus is doing this, uh, I will tell you a little bit more about the oven. So, uh, it, there's actually no fire going in there at the moment. Uh, it's just some coals left from the previous fire. Uh, so there's a couple of things that we could do if you really wanted to you could get another fire going So throw some kindling onto the coals that are at the back um, yeah, A little bit of kindling on there at, at 200 degrees. It's actually really easy to get a fire going It's much easier than getting a fire going at 20 degrees um, So if we wanted a little fire going we could have one what we're doing here. We don't actually need a fire. We just need hot air around the, the the well this what would you call this this crock pot sort of arrangement yeah, that, we're, exactly. that we're doing so Make we don't sure have to have flame to cook in the wood-fired oven because the the d105 has a metric ton of thermal mass that stays hot for a really long time so we that's what we're actually going to be cooking with we're not cooking with a fire the, the heat of the fire we're actually cooking from the heat that's trapped in the walls and the floor of the oven so it's just another way of, of using the oven. Um, don't cry, Mark. It's, it's going to be <laughs> I'm okay. Like, I'm trying to like look down. You're doing so, so good. <laughs> I just heard this little whimpering. <laughs> uh, anyway, you, you, can, you can use the oven without a fire going in it. We've actually done a video called How a Wood-Fired Oven Works. We shot it in, uh, in Washington State in the US. Uh, and we demonstrated, like we cook pizza in a, a P85 oven, just using the residual heat that was stored in the oven. So that's what we're gonna be doing today, is um, we're, we're not actually gonna get a fire going, we're just gonna be cooking from the residual heat that's in there. The, other, the coals that we do have in there, as Marcus goes to, to try his <laughs> eyes, the coals that we do have in there are just gonna give us some flavor. So later on, when we, uh, when we take the lid, off this pan, we're going to get a bit of smoky flavor into the chicken. And there's something about chicken, as Marcus slowly recovers. Oh, yeah. There's something That's about better. chicken. Do you know what it is? Why is it the chicken absorbs so much of that smoky flavor? I don't, like the steak had a bit of that, it had yep, char, yep. it was delicious. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, I find for some reason chicken 
really absorbs the smoky flavor really well. I don't know if it's just like a fatty skin that does it or... Look, I couldn't actually answer that for you. I, I find taking the, the lid off of the chicken, it really helps with the brownie. Yeah. Um, you're just gonna is other because otherwise it's sort of it's sort of um it's a very humid environment. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So that's really for getting the color. I do agree with you though. Like chicken does seem to absorb more of that, that There's flavor. There's science behind uh, it. But I, I definitely couldn't tell you yeah, tell yeah. you why. Not chefs. I mean, not, not chefs. No. Again, not chefs. A chef probably wouldn't have this on their bench. This this is <clears throat> a uh, custom made uh, lid for this little arrangement that we got over here, um, and. It, it was once a wok, um, uh, so we just uh, lost the, the handles, and it makes a very nice, neat little little lid for this. Now I'm sure Solid Technics are going to call us tomorrow uh, and let us know that they actually have a, an actual lid for this. So <laughs> we'll keep it. We'll keep an ear out. Solid Technics, you, you've been you've been warned. Some garlic, mm -hmm. and then we'll just do a little bit of seasoning onto the veggies themselves. A bit of oil. And uh, just a very slight amount of water. Um, okay. And that's just going to allow, you know, more of those juices to come up through the chicken itself. Yep. Now we'll just put a little bit of seasoning onto, onto the veggies themselves. So I've just got a little bit of rosemary here. Again, I'll just take a little bit off. All right, so that's our, our veggies prepped. Just a little bit of oil. Beautiful. Beautiful. Look at that. And then we've just got some seasoning. So we'll just put some salt in there and some pepper. Perfect. That's our veggies all prepped. Salt, pepper, salt, olive oil, pepper, bit olive of water. Oil. And we'll put a little bit of water with the chicken. With the chicken. With okay. the chicken. Cool, yep. cool. Yep. So we'll just put that aside. Now we'll get our, our chicken ready. So it's all been washed and it's ready to go essentially. That's, that was... That was pretty straightforward. Wait, very, this is a very, very fast. Roughly chop some, some veggies. Exactly. And, and that's the beauty of it is just that it's essentially chop it all up really roughly, throw it in there, throw the chicken on, put the lid on, yep. bang it in the oven. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, beautiful. We're just going to clean up this oven, this chicken a little bit, take some of this fat off the back. Perfect. So that's essentially the chicken prepared. It's really what you're wanting to do is just wash the chicken out. That's the, that's the most important part. Then we are literally just putting the chicken on top. We'll season that. And then we'll be ready to put it in the oven. All right, it's time to season our chicken. We've got all our veggies in there, all seasoned up and oiled, ready to go. Uh, it's very simple for the chicken as well. We're just gonna use a bit of salt, a bit of pepper, and a bit of garlic powder. So you just wanna get that over the top, trying to get as much of the chicken as we can. Do you need to rub it in? Or can you just... You I've can just, just I've just sprinkled it over top and it's been fine for okay. me. I just put a yep. fair bit on. Yep. Um, because it's, a, it, you know, it's about all those, the steam coming up through the chicken with all the flavor of the rosemary and the veggies, which mm. are giving it that flavor. Yep. You can also, rather than using a bit of water, you can use a bit of chicken stock in there. Okay. Uh, which will add some extra flavor. Yep. Uh, but I find water, it just gives a really nice taste I as well. I feel like there's going to be a lot of flavor in it. Exactly, already. exactly. And just a bit of pepper and then a little bit of garlic. Is that more rosemary over there? That's, put... No, I'm not going to put any more rosemary okay. in this one. <laughs> it's just, that's leftover. I did look at it, I, I bought, I was like, could, you could go some more. You love rosemary. I do love rosemary. So a fair bit of garlic powder on here. And don't, don't be shy about getting it on the veggies as well. That's absolutely fine. Beautiful. Now we're just adding that bit of water. So we just have a small amount of water here. You can see that there. And we're just going to be adding in just a small drizzle around the edges. It's on the veggies, not on the chicken. On the veggies, yeah. Okay. yeah. Otherwise, we're just going to wash off all that, yeah. that seasoning. Yep. Now, and you just want... I'm not sure if you can that see on the like camera here. That looks like about half a cup, I would about, say. For yeah. those who actually want some measurements, which will be in the instructions, right? Be, the, yeah, the, yeah. Sorry, the, the, the recipes. recipes. <laughs> the instructions. <laughs> the, instru yeah. the cooking, the cooking instructions. instructions. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, so as you can see here, there's just like a small amount of the, the liquid at the bottom, that water at the bottom. Yep. Um, you know, the veggies are, are just in the water. It's not very much at all. Yeah, that looks like about, uh, about five mil in the bottom of the yeah, pan. Exactly. Not much. Exactly. Much. All right. The next thing we do is chuck our, our lid on. Our <coughs> custom made. Our makeshift lid. Lid. Boop. Bang in the oven. Maybe an hour and a half, two hours. We'll be good to go. We'll take that lid off in about... An hour, let it really crisp up. Yep. Job's done. 
Before I put the oven door back in, I just want to point out that there's really nothing going on in there. There's no, I'm not even seeing any glowing embers. Um, I think it might be a couple twinkling at the back, but there's no fire burning. It's just the heat that's trapped in the walls and the floor in the thermal mass of the oven that's gonna be doing the cooking. So we'll get the door back on. So remember, if you're using your door and you wanna do, you wanna seal the chamber, we tilt it all the way forward and close it. And now we play the waiting game. We do, we have a, we have a wine, we have a beer, we play some pool. Sounds good. And Joe, oh, you're going down. All right, so we've had our, um, our chicken in there for about an hour and a half now. Um, now about an hour into the cooking, we actually pull it out, pull the lid off and slid it back in. Still put the door on the oven as you can see. Um, and that's just to allow the chicken to kind of brown on that top, get that nice caramelization that you're after. Um, so we're gonna pull it out of the oven now. Let's have a look. Let's do it. We're after about 75 degrees um, Celsius internal temperature. So we're just gonna double check that to just make sure we are completely cooked all the way through. So I'll pull this out now. Uh, and we have a beautiful, nice browning on there. That it's looks gorgeous. gorgeous. All right, what do we got? Now you wanna make sure that you're going into the thickest part of the meat and you're yep. not touching any of the bones. Okay, I, yeah, I did feel a bone just then. So 75, 76 degrees, we are perfectly, perfectly cooked there. Yeah. That's awesome. Awesome. So, so you see we've got like that beautiful, nice brownie on the top. Um, you gorgeous. could you could leave it in there for a little bit longer if you wanted, but this is probably the, the kind of char I'm looking for on my roast chicken. Um, and you'll also see that with our, with our veggies here, they're all, now don't touch that like I just did, that was silly. Uh, they're, they're beautifully cooked yeah, as well. So they're That's just nice easily soft. pierced. I'm not even putting any pressure on them. Perfect. Man, it looks fantastic. And, and that was just using residual heat in the oven. We yep. didn't have a fire burning. No. And that, again, that's one of those things that it's, it's great to be aware of. You don't need to have a fire going to cook in one of our wood fired ovens. There's so much thermal mass in there. It, exactly. it stays hot for a very, very long time. And I love hearing about people using the full cycle of heat. Yes, so cooking yes. all the way down. So the oven's still, this, this oven's still at two, well, it's dropped to about, well, it's just under 200 now. Yeah, so it went from, what was that, 220 to It was to 220, <laughs> yeah, down to 190. Yeah. So there's still lots of, we could, we could do some baking now if exactly. we really wanted yep. to. And so if you're organized, if you, uh, uh, if you plan it out, there's all these different things that you can cook using the full cycle of heat in the oven. And uh, we, we love hearing about people doing that. Even say with the D105, tomorrow this oven will be down into, dipping down to about 100 degrees, maybe slightly below that. Uh, and so then we can start doing some of the, the slower cooking. Mm. Uh, and that's actually something that we'll show you in some future videos. Uh, but in yeah. the meantime, um, Marcus, Thank you very much for coming in today. No, that's fine. It's, I mean, been, you, it's been a great day. You get paid, but you know. I get paid, No, yeah. no, no, he probably, <laughs> probably would have come anyway, to be honest. Um, we've been so excited about doing this. So we have, yeah. This and and this brilliant. is what I love to do. This yeah. is, I love cooking, so it's, and yeah. cooking over in the ovens. It's my yeah. passion, it's really, really fun. No, it's been brilliant. Um, so this is certainly not the last time you'll be seeing uh, this man. He will be back. He is our resident, uh, not chef, but we Very cook. competent cook. <laughs> um, and so guys, thank you so much for watching. We really hope you've enjoyed the video. It's been a lot of fun to make. I think you've probably picked up on that. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you next time.